Madison, remember a year ago, all of us from all three sites packed into the gym at Wellspring. None of us even dreaming about ever wearing a mask. Anointed worship, lifting up our praise and prayers to God. It was amazing. Everyone I talked to that day said, we should do this again. And in fact, we began dreaming about when we could do it again. May 31, we thought, Pentecost Sunday. Little did we know, that none of us would be gathering even as individual sites, at least not in person, for seven long months. It's been too long. We are feeling it. The words from Psalm 42 take on a new intensity. When can we go and meet with God? So let me say a few words about where things stand with respect to regathering. Throughout the summer, leaders from Madison were meeting with other local churches, both in our classes and in our community. And we had a mutual agreement that we wouldn't regather indoors until Michigan was in phase five. That was back when we thought phase five was just around the corner. When it became apparent that phase five is actually much farther away, our task force and our staff and our council reassessed and began to put in place parameters for what it would look like to begin regathering, yes, indoors, in person, but at a reduced capacity. And one of our green light indicators for that would be that we would have a seven day average positivity rate for COVID in Kent County of 4% or less. That plan was brought to council, council gave their thumbs up, and then they left it to the leaders at each of the sites to convey it to their own congregations because we have such a diversity of size and physical space at each of our sites. And then the COVID numbers in Kent County began to spike again. So what had been sitting at a one to 3% positivity rate in August and early weeks of September, now in more recent days and weeks has really escalated. As of yesterday, we are at 5.9% for a seven day average positivity rate in Kent County. If you would like to keep tabs on those numbers yourself, you can just search for Kent County dashboard. All kinds of data will pop up. If you go to page six, you'll see a map and you'll also see a number there that's listed for the overall seven day average rate in all of Michigan. But if you click on an individual county, you can also see the county rate. And as it indicates right now, the numbers are, are, are pretty high for Kent County. And we are longing to meet. In upcoming weeks, you'll hear more from your own sites about what it looks like to remain connected even as we are scattered. And you'll hear more about the plans for regathering for when the numbers do begin to go back down again. But in the meantime, what is God up to in this? It's not lost on me that our series in Daniel is extremely appropriate. I mean, a time of political and government unrest, a time where people are exiled. And yet we see over and over in Daniel that God doesn't wait for exile to be over in order to meet his people, but instead he meets them right in the midst of exile. Over and over in Daniel, we see the recurring theme that God is supreme over nations and situations, including this one. There are all kinds of grace stories coming out of all of our congregations and our all site leadership team has been meeting regularly and all kinds of really beautiful work is happening. You'll hear about that in upcoming videos. But for now, God is with us. God is at work amongst us. And even in this period that feels dormant and separate, 
May God actually grow our roots down so deep in him that our faith, our resilient faith grows and grows deeper and then is sparked for a creative, imaginative mission. God, thank you that you are with us. Thank you that you are at work and continue to lead us your church. Amen. God bless. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. The Lord is my shepherd. He goes before me.
Morning, Madison. My name is Pastor Daryl Delaney. I'm the campus pastor here at Madison Church at the Square Campus. And I just want to inform you of two things that you need to know today as we go forth in this sermon series. The first is the message that you're going to hear is going to be preached by Pastor Brad Kinech of the Franklin Campus. And he is going to be bringing the word from Daniel chapter six today. The second thing you need to know is that after this message, There will be a Zoom social for you to interact and join into. So there will be a link in the description below so that you can click the Zoom and join right in. And the idea is to fellowship with each other, to debrief the sermon, to catch up on how we're doing, because it's been really difficult to get together during these times. And we're looking for more creative ways to experiment and try to get connected. And so the Zoom social is happening right after this message. And you'll be able to go right in and comment and connect with each other. And I uh, think it would be a good thing to pray there as well. So just join us there after this message. So Pastor Brad's preaching the word. May God use him to teach Daniel 6 today, but also meet us right after this for our Zoom social. God bless you. Good morning, everyone. Let's now go into a time of prayer together. If you want, you can stand, you can sit, you can kneel. However you feel prompted at this time to pray, let us seek the Lord together, continuing in our worship through prayer. Let's pray. Giving honor to God, who is the head of all of our lives. Oh, Lord, we give you all of the glory, all of the honor, all of the praise. You are our refuge. You are sovereign. You reign over all things. You are our strength. You are our rock. You are our redeemer. You provide salvation, Lord, which is what we so desperately need. Not self-help, but you provide salvation for our souls. We thank you for the way of the gospel, where we need the gospel week in, week out. And you call us to repent, to confess, and surrender what is tripping us up, the sins that we've been caught up in, and we lay them down now at the foot of the cross. Because it's at the cross where you rescued us. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. We all need your grace just as much as every single person. And so given what you have accomplished for us, Lord, we praise you for forgiving us, for giving us grace and mercy and abundant life that is promised in you. Hallelujah, Lord. We give you all of the glory and honor and praise today. And we pray over the state of the globe today, over the nation, over our state, over the city, over the block, over the corner, Madison and Franklin. And Lord, we thank you that you hold all things in your hands. You hold our lives in your hands and you call us to trust you, to worship you, to glorify you. Lord God, we pray for healing in the places where we have wounds and brokenness. And Lord, we pray for the gospel to go down deep into our hearts so that we might share your gospel hope, your good news, your grace, and your mercy. Lord, we thank you that you call us as your disciples to simply follow you. You say, come, come and follow me in order to also be disciple makers. We lift up Lord, what is taking place within the life of the body right now. And we thank you, Lord, that you provide a way. You provide the truth. You provide life. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen, amen, and amen. Good morning, everyone. It is an honor and a privilege to share with you, to preach God's word for you this morning from Daniel 6. And to get at today's passage, what I'd like to do is to set things up by looking at our vision. The vision of our church is following Christ, 
It is all about him following Christ together as diverse communities. Okay, And so we, as the preaching team from across the sites, we've been going through the book of Daniel chapter by chapter. We're now midway through our series called Resilient Faith, Gospel Hope Found in the Book of Daniel. And we've been asking this question from week to week, how do we follow Christ with resilient faith no matter what the circumstance? And one of the things that we're learning as we've been going through this series, is that resilient faith isn't about what you or I are going to do. It's not about being better, working harder, striving more. It's, um, it's not about self-help or advice. In fact, you can take your pointer finger and point to yourself and say, self, there's no help in self. There isn't. I've looked in there. <laughs> And what's inside here is a man who is in desperate need of Jesus Christ. We want to be a God-centered, God-dependent people. So as we approach the scriptures, the main goal is to see what God is up to. We want to be a Christ-exalting, spirit-filled, God-centered church. And a God-centered view of scripture empowers us. It fills us up in order to see what God is doing and then how he calls us and how he empowers us to follow him. All right. So given that this morning, as we're looking at the book of Daniel, it's less about Daniel and more about Daniel's God. It is all about what he is doing. Keep your eyes open for what God is doing in today's passage from Daniel 6. And I got three points for you today, and then I'll be out of your way. Number one, we want to look at the problem. Number two, the prayer. And lastly, we want to look at the power. Okay, this is a phenomenal passage. I am excited to go section by section. I'd like to preach exegetically. What that means is that we're going to go section by section, pausing along the way because the entire story builds upon itself. And as we do that, we want to dig out, we want to exegete God's truth and then apply it to our lives today. So number one, we want to look at the problem, all right? Let's just jump right into today's passage, and then I'll pause in a couple of verses, and let's break it down today. All right, let's begin. Daniel 6, 1 through 5. It pleased Darius to appoint 120 satraps to rule throughout the kingdom with three administrators over them, one of whom was Daniel. You might be wondering what exactly are satraps? Just hold on tight. The satraps were made accountable to them so that the king might not suffer loss. Now Daniel so distinguished himself from the administrators and the satraps by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. At this, the administrators and the satraps tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel in his conduct of government affairs because they were unable to do so. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. Finally, these men said, We will never find any basis for charges against this man, Daniel, unless it has something to do with the law of his God. So let's just take a moment and step back from these five verses to just get our bearings to figure out where we're at right now. My title for this morning is simply called this, Praying in a Pit with Lions, okay? And to see really where the scenes are headed, things begin in the king's court, which is what these first couple of verses are. Then things are going to move to the lowest of the low. We're going to find ourselves in a pit, and then we're going to be raised up out of that pit. But it's always important to ask that whenever you read a narrative, especially in the Old Testament, to ask who are the main characters. And so let's see who are the major players of today's story from Daniel 6 and go one by one. Number one is Daniel. He is God's prophet exiled from his home of Israel to Babylon, and he is now 90 years of age. Number two, we have King Darius, and he is the current king of Babylon. Babylon has had many kings, and King Darius is up to bat. 
Then number three, we have these administrators, these satraps. Who are they? Essentially, they're government officials sworn to carry out the king's edicts, any of the king's decrees they have to follow through on. And then lastly, the other characters that we see are lions in a pit. Enough said there. So knowing that one of the main characters in our story are lions makes this pretty interesting and will definitely keep us on our toes. I can remember a number of years ago, back in 2005, I went to Fuller uh, Theological Seminary for a year down in Los Angeles. And if you've been to LA, one of the crazy things about this city is not just how massive it is, like the urban sprawl of LA, there's nothing like it. But it's also nestled between all these different mountain ranges, right? So LA is really at the foothills of a number of different mountains. In particular, I was living right near the base of the San Gabriel Mountains. And I remember one particular Sunday afternoon, I had some time on my hands. And so I hopped in my car, I drove up Highway 10, and I parked in this parking lot with this a fairly well-used trailhead. And so no joke, I walk in on this trailhead about 200 feet and I just hang out. It's a scene kind of similar to this. So imagine this with me, if you could, walking down a nice mountain trail like this, you're actually not that far from your car, um, right? Like 200 feet or so. And I start moving and I hear something. And out of the corner of my eye, maybe 30, 40 feet from me, for real, I lock eyes on a brown bear. The brown bear looks at me. I look at him. He bolts it in the other direction. Thankfully, I run in the other direction as fast as humanly possible. I dive into my car and drive down the mountain as fast as I could encountering a large wild animal is a bad thing. <laughs> I'm just getting shivers thinking about it. Now, imagine being in a den, a pit full of lions, similar to this. That's a very bad thing. So finding yourself in a pit with a den full of hungry lions looks like this, and it qualifies, right, as a terrible, horrible, no good day. In fact, the odds of surviving this thing are zero. Most people see lions as 500 pound problems, okay? And so how does Daniel find himself in a room full of them? Well, it's very simple. The government officials are jealous and they want nothing more for themselves to be promoted and him to be demoted. Daniel is a trusted, consistent, disciplined man of God who has won the heart of the king. He's a man of, Daniel's a man of wisdom. And so they conspire against him. They manipulate the situation and they want to make sure that he is just handled. And so this leads into our second point today, which is praying in a pit with lions. And a couple of different events are gonna take place over these next few verses. And here's what I want you to do. I know we have a couple of folks who love to take notes and then apply them uh, into your given week. Take note of the emotional responses to the events that take place from the various characters, all right? Let's continue reading God's word. So these administrators and satraps went as a group to the king and said, May King Darius live forever. The royal administrators, prefects, satraps, advisors, and governors have all agreed that the king should issue an edict and enforce the decree that anyone who prays to any god or human being during the next 30 days, except to you, your majesty, shall be thrown into the lion's den. Now, your majesty... Issue the decree and put it in writing so that it cannot be altered in accordance with the law of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be repealed. So King Darius put the decree in writing. Now, when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. Three times a day, watch this, three times a day he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God just as he had done before. Then these men went as a group and found Daniel praying and asking God for help. So they went to the king and spoke to him about his royal decree. Did you not publish a decree that during the next 30 days, anyone who prays to any God or human except to you, your majesty would be thrown into the lion's den? 
The king answered, The decree stands in accordance with the law of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be repealed. Then they said to the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, your majesty, or to the decree you, are, you put in writing. He still prays three times a day. When the king heard this, he was greatly distressed. He was determined to rescue Daniel and made every effort until sundown to save him. Then the men went as a group to King Darius and said to him, Remember your majesty that according to the law of the Medes and Persians, no decree or edict that the king issues can be changed. So the king gave the order and they brought Daniel and threw him into the lion's den. The king said to Daniel, May your God, whom you serve, continually rescue you. And then a stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den. And the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the rings of his nobles so that Daniel's situation might not be changed. Then the king returned to his palace and spent the night without eating and without any, any entertainment being brought to him. And he could not sleep. So let's continue here and pause and look at the emotional responses to the events that are taking place from the various characters, right? The government officials, they're stressed because they're working very hard to coerce the king to do what they want, right? They're classic con men and they're stressed to make sure all the angles are working. And then you have King Darius. This guy can't sleep. He doesn't want entertainment. He's freaked out because he has concern for Daniel. But who's the one person who's not stressed? It's Daniel. You know, there's like this APB put out around the whole kingdom saying everyone needs to pray to King Darius. What happens? Verse 10 is what happens. When he learns the decree had been published, here's his response. He goes upstairs, windows open to his native homeland. Three times a day, he gets on his knees and he thanks God just as he has done before. This is absolutely massive. His life is threatened for praying to God, what does he do? He prays to God, and even more than that, he gives thanks to God in his prayer for the situation that he is facing. He's facing it with joy. Now, this is like the PhD level of resilient faith. And if you're like me, I gotta start in the kindergarten level, <laughs> or better yet, I gotta start at pre-K and take it step by step. And here's one way to build up to that that I came across through this book called The Deeply Formed Life. Five transformative values to root us in the way of Jesus. The author is Pastor Rich Velotis of New Life Fellowship down in Queens, New York. And right in the middle of this book, he, he brings up something about the importance of taking inventory of our reactions. Okay, so hold with me for a bit, because in the scripture of Daniel 6, we see really an inventory, a summary of all these different emotional reactions to events. Well, let's take that same picture and apply it for us today, because events happen that do something to us, that cause us to react. Events can happen that trigger us. And let me just ask you this question before I go further. Is there anything that triggers you? perhaps an event that happens and it does something in your heart. So just, just keep that in mind as I share the following from Pastor Rich. In the fall of 2018, for a month's time, I decided that I would take inventory of my reactions. I noticed that I was easily being triggered by criticisms and I carried a nagging sense of uneasiness about difficult conversations that needed to be had. And then he said, I resolved to take a few minutes during the day to process the moment through five questions. And here they are. Number one, what happened? Number two, what am I feeling? Three, what is the story I'm telling myself? Number four, what does the gospel say? And then number five, unique question, what counter instinctual action is needed? And then he gives an example. And so he was helping plan a prayer event at their church. They fly in a well-known Christian author and speaker. Everything's going well. And he receives an email. Raise your hand if you've ever been triggered by email. All right. Hallelujah. Except this email that he got from the author who was coming was kind. There wasn't a single hurtful word in the message. 
it was just a couple of suggestions to enhance the event. Everything you'd think is, is going fine, but it triggers something in Pastor Rich, something he wasn't even able to figure out or articulate. So he closes the laptop, sits on it, stews on it for about 20, 30 minutes, and then he writes the following as a journal entry. What happened? A well-known leader offered constructive feedback, but what am I feeling? Shame. What is the story I'm telling myself? that if I don't do things right the first time or ever for that matter, that I'm defective. But what does the gospel say? The gospel says my failures don't define me. The love of God defines me. And then number five, what counter instinctual action is needed? Share this with my wife because I tend to keep moments like this to myself. So everybody, these are some very powerful questions, simple tools that you can take home with you and you can apply them right, to smaller issues, to larger ones as well. My wife calls these scuba questions because it kind of starts on the surface, the snorkeling questions, and then it goes step by step deeper and deeper to expose what's going on in our hearts in order to lay our lives down before Jesus and receive his healing. And that requires work. It requires effort to expose what's going on in here. Jesus even talks about this, right? On the Sermon on the Mount, he says, it's much easier to to see the speck of dust in someone else's eyes in order to see this glaring log that's in our own. Daniel could have focused on all the external problems. There was a ton of conflict and confrontation, but instead he does something counter-instinctual, which we need to apply in 2020, because this has been a year unlike any other. There's been a lot of conflict, a lot of con- confrontation. We're in election season. It's coming up just a couple of weeks away. No matter what the issues are, it's so easy to examine and see the problems in someone else's view. The norm is really to point out what's bad and kick, civil- and kick civility out the window. We are accustomed you know, to viewing, to judging, comparing ourselves to others. The way of self-examination and to see what's going on in here, Woo-hoo-hoo. that's hard. What is Daniel's response to the conflict that he faces? Well, it's a gospel pointer, even to what Jesus ultimately shows us, is that he prays to do the will of his Father in heaven. For Daniel, to do the will of his Father who sent him into exile, who even sent him into this very difficult situation. Everyone, everything is saying, just worship King Darius. Give your life to him. And the counter-instinctual response is to be remain, is to remain rooted in the power of prayer. So number one, we looked at the problem. Number two, we looked at prayer in a pit with lions. And then lastly, let's land the plane here on the power of God. Number three, let's continue on in our scripture. At the first light of dawn, the king got up and hurried to the lion's den. When he came near the den, he called to Daniel in an anguished voice. Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you serve continually been able to rescue you from the lions? Daniel answered, may the king live forever. My God sent his angel and he shut the mouths of the lions, they have not hurt me, because I was found innocent in his sight, nor have I ever done any wrong before you, your majesty. The king was overjoyed and gave orders to lift Daniel out of the den, and when Daniel was lifted from the den, no wound was found on him because he had trusted in his God. Here we see God perform a miracle. I love the word these miracles that we see in scripture, this one is just incredible and life-changing. Daniel gives God all the glory, and here we see some evangelism. This king gets converted as a believer. Check it out. Then King Darius wrote to all the nations and peoples of every language in all the earth, may you prosper greatly. I issue a decree that in every part of my kingdom, people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel. For he is the living God and he endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. He rescues and he saves. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. So Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. 
So everyone, this is a powerful, incredible passage that we've been reading today because we've looked at the problem. We look at prayer in the pit. And then lastly, the power of God at work. And the lions that we see in this passage, they're a big deal, but it's all just a pointer, guys. It's a pointer to our Savior who destroys the enemy once and for all. The events that we see in Daniel 6 are set in motion for what eventually takes place. In 1 Peter 5, verse 8, there's a very timely scripture that says, Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. You know, lions, they go after the young, the weak, and the wounded, and that's just exponential with the enemy. For example, he will go after the young. That's one of his tactics, whether young in the faith or the up-and-coming generation. And if that's you today, are you on guard to the tactics of a very real enemy who, as Scripture says, he comes, he, he lurks, he prowls, searching for someone for whom he will devour. This is a huge deal. This is heaven and hell at stake. And are you on guard if this is where you're at right now? And if you look at Daniel, when he was young, he had a couple of guys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who loved the Lord and who were committed to him so that Daniel wasn't alone in following the Lord, but he had a couple of guys. This is what the church is designed for, men and women coming together to hold each other up, to be focused on the Lord, no matter what the tactics of the enemy may be, because he also comes after the weak and the wounded. And if we're able to acknowledge what some of those areas are, the weaknesses or the wounds what we're called to do is to take those and bring them to Jesus, to bring them at the foot of the cross. But the enemy, he does not want that. He wants us to be distracted with whatever weaknesses or wounds we may have and then just pour shame on that or pour different things that keep us not on target with the Lord. We can fill what's going on in here, the hurts, with music, with movies, with food, um, with voices, podcasts that keep us distracted from the Lord and his salvation. There is only one way. There is only one way how we can withhold any mauling from the lions and from the enemy himself. And that is to be surrendered to Jesus Christ, to believe in the salvation of the world, to believe in the Lion of Judah, as he is also referred to as. Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and even under the earth. No one has that power, that authority, more so than Jesus Christ. And in him, we receive assurance, we receive confidence, we receive a way to respond to and to be protected from the attacks of the enemy. Jesus, all hope is found in him. He is the beginning and the end. He is the first and the last he is the keeper of all creation. He's the keeper of your soul. He started this all and he will bring it to completion. He always was, always is, always shall be. Omniscient, omnipotent, all-powerful, all-knowing, and forever undefeated. He is our Lord. He is light. He is good. He is gracious. He is filled with joy. He is our hope. He is our refuge. He is our strength. And you are constantly on his mind. So much to the point where he sparked the greatest movement ever imagined. A movement that continues today, that ushers in the kingdom of God. And he, alongside this movement, ushered in his gospel, the good news brought to those who desire to be saved. And what we see in the work of Jesus is really what we see in Daniel 6 is a foreshadowing of what Jesus does. That he goes into the ultimate pit, the pit 
of receiving all sin on his back, past, present, and future. He receives even hell itself. He becomes our substitute because Romans tells us that the wages of our sin is death. And so we need a way out. Jesus takes that upon himself, our place on the cross. And now in him, what we see three days later, he rises out, out of the pit, out of the grave, out of the den of what the enemy thought he could hold him down. Praise be to Jesus Christ, who has victory over all. He is the way, he is the truth, and he is the life. So no matter what pit we may face, no matter what adversity we may face, Jesus is with us and he provides a way out. As a way of closing with my time with you today, I want to just uh, dim the lights for a moment. And I want to simply ask this question. What pit are you facing? Maybe you're in one right now. Maybe you're anticipating one right on the horizon. But whatever the problem, whatever the pit may be, just keep that in your mind's eye. And then I'm going to hit the lights. So as a way to ask that question again, what is the pit that you are facing right now in this season? Because here's the thing about being in a pit. It's dark. It's lonely. You can feel isolated, right? But the thing about Daniel, when he was in the pit, when it was dark, when he was just with those lions, you know, he wasn't focused on the problem. He was focused on the power of God in prayer. In fact, that's pretty good. <laughs> you can type that and say, focus on the power. Because Daniel, throughout his life, man, he faced so many different pits. One was a, a fiery furnace. And he said, my God is able to save. And yet, whether he does or he doesn't save, all glory goes to him. Because our Lord has all power. And just like I've got this small flame here from this candle, Jesus says, come and follow me. Even if right now, even in the pit that you're facing, even if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, a mustard seed that is smaller than, than this very flame, even with that faith, God can use to move mountains. May we be a people focused on the power of God. Because even in the pit, even in the areas of weakness, here's what scripture has to say. Check out 1 Corinthians 12, which says, The grace of Jesus is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. The power of Christ the power of our God, the power of the Holy Spirit is made sufficient in our weakness, in the lowest areas of life, in the valleys, in the pits of life. God's power is made perfect. That's what it's designed for. That's why grace, right? It pools like rain in the lowest areas of our lives. That's where we need him the most and his grace is made sufficient. May we be a people who bear witness to the power of God made sufficient, made perfect, even in the lowest areas. All right, may we be a people as well like Daniel who lift our heads from the problem and focus on the power of God. So in a moment, I'm gonna close with a blessing, but I wanted to share this as well because today's message is being shared for both the Franklin campus and the Square campus. And we wanted to share this important word. Have you made a decision for Christ? Have you made a decision to follow Jesus Christ? And if you are sensing in your heart a prompting to say yes to following Christ for the first time, oh man, this is what it's all about. Please send us an email right here and in the subject say yes to Jesus. Hallelujah. Those are phenomenal emails to open up. And depending on where you're watching this, send it to either the Square or the Franklin contacts there. We want to see you grow in the gospel of Jesus, to be a disciple of Jesus, and to be disciple makers for the Lord as well. So with that, I'm going to ask that you stand to your feet and receive today's blessing. A blessing is God's grace poured over us to strengthen us, to encourage us to go out into this week. And the beautiful thing about grace is it's like rain. It just falls. We just receive it. And grace pools, right? Like rain, it's raining right now. And it pools in the lowest areas of our lives. 
grace from the Lord comes over us from the top of our head to the sole of our feet. Hear today's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord turn his face to shine upon you. May this be a week where God lifts your head from the problems that you may face to focus on the power of God that is at work to strengthen and to encourage you and to lift you up. Know that Jesus Christ has given his life for you. God the Father loves you and that the Holy Spirit is with you to guide you forward in the purposes of the kingdom of God. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, you may go in peace. Amen, amen, and amen.